Rowe is a veterinarian professor at Michigan State University. Yes, we did bring you guys from outside of the state in for this, so be nice to us. So we drove down for this. So, Bo, why don't you go ahead and go? Thank you, Beth. Well, luckily, I'm not a big, well, I shouldn't say big fan, but I don't know much about college sports and so forth, so I won't bring any of that up. So, my name is Bo Norby. Uh, I'll give you just a short background of who I am and what I've been doing and so forth. Originally, well, I should say originally, most of my life I lived in Denmark, but I came to the U.S. in, in 95 and I spent like three years in California. Uh, and then I went to Michigan State and did my graduate work there. I worked on bovine tuberculosis because I was right after that, that broke in, in Michigan. And then uh, I had the pleasure of spending uh, seven years in College Station, Texas. Um, at my first, it's not my first real job, but after I got my education at least. Uh, so I was there for seven years and then a little over two years ago I got back to, to Michigan State. So I, I've been there since since then. Um, for the last 10 years or so, I've been working mainly on antimicrobial resistance, so primarily uh, foodborne pathogens that can be transmitted from, from uh, farm animals through the food to humans. And uh, I've been working a little bit of bovine leukosis virus too, and a little bit of on the transition cow diseases. Um, so doing this work on antimicrobial resistance and uh, it all started with actually comparing uh, resistance in bacteria from organic and, and conventional farms. And we did it in pigs, but there are a couple of groups at Michigan State that did it in, in organic dairies and uh, conventional dairies. So we learned a little bit about you know, treatment options and that different uh, production systems have. And when I got back to Michigan State, I talking to my old uh, advisor and we thought that there aren't really a lot of, of treatment options, at least treatment options that have been evaluated and, and so forth for, for um, treating clinical mastitis in, in cows on, on organic dairy farms. So there's some information on, on some products that might be um, efficacious. So at least in respect to killing, so non-antibiotic uh, compounds or substances that might be able to kill bacteria that we thought we'd look into. So, are all of you uh, dairy people? No? What do you do? If you don't mind me asking, I mean... <laughs> we grow peas, but we start growing our, uh, producing our own babies. Oh, you grow beef. Okay. Excellent. I saw a lot of beef cows in Texas. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said I have dairy goats. You do have dairy goats. Okay. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> most of you organic producers? Okay. Well, uh, hopefully, I, I'm, not, I'm not a mastitis expert for sure, and I'm certainly not an organic expert either, but, but uh, we learned a little bit along the way with, with these projects that we've been going on. So uh, I just want to briefly thank, first of all, Sari, for, for funding the, the project. And as Beth said, I mean, it is heavily on, on research, but kind of during the whole uh, project to have interactions with producers and organic uh, organizations and so forth and uh, so kind of helps tie everything together and as best said in the introduction I mean I I'm certainly here to learn as well so if you have any any good insight I would definitely like to uh, to hear it and of course if I, for letting me speak down here today I just want three peoples uh, that I'm working with uh, that I would like to, to thank for, for all their help. And then John Rawcliffe, which he's the general manager, I think, of Unu uh, Unique Manuka Honey Factor Association in New Zealand. And that's the product we've been working with thus far. 
So a quick, uh, quick overview, I'll talk a little bit about milk quality and mastitis and some of the current options for mastitis treatment focused on uh, organic, uh, some new potential options and, and a little bit of concluding remarks uh, in the end. Um, what do you guys see as, as the main health issues uh, with your cows, if you don't mind me asking? Mastitis, you think? Okay. Well, so it seems to be still the the main the main issue on on both conditional, I'm sorry, conventional and and organic dairies. And there are a lot of cost estimates, but clinical mastitis at least have been estimated to uh, cost you know 150 to 200 dollars per episode. So that includes treatments, loss of milk, added. Um, labor and so forth. So one estimate of, of uh, medication costs for clinical mastitis would seem to be about twice as much on, on conventional dairies than it is on, on organic dairies. But in general, comparing between the two types of, of production systems is, can be quite difficult because management is a huge thing and and it's something that's really hard to control for when, when you're comparing uh, between production systems. It definitely costs the US dairy industry, whether it's conventional or organic, a lot of money every year. So, uh, so for, for the organic, as you know, I mean, you don't have the antibiotic treatment option. So, so herd health, I guess, and in, in uh, in general, are, are based much more on preventive measures and, and management and so forth. And uh, both, both on conventional and organic production, I mean, reducing the occurrence and severity of mastitis, you know, is prevention, promote health, vaccinations, uh, good nutrition, and particularly uh, much less stress perhaps on, on the organic than on a, on a conventional farm. And cows are really like consistency, so, so that's, that's important. Uh, so on conventional dairies at least, antibiotics are typically used for, for treatment of, of uh, clinical cases of mastitis, so new cases, but also very much used uh, as dry cow treatment, so when you dry the cows off. So, as you know, those are not allowed on organic farms, and I'll get back to that uh, a little bit later. In respect to milk quality on organic and conventional farms, I mean, it seems, seems like what's available in the literature, at least, that, that they're pretty comparable. Um, but most of the information now is, is from, uh, from Europe. And at least looking at the information from Europe, it's important to remember that, that there they can use antibiotics uh, limited. They have longer withdrawal times and so forth, but there can be limited use of, of antibiotics. So at least a measure of um, overall um, health status in respect to mastitis and so both tank somatic cell counts seem to be relatively similar between conventional and organic, organic herds. But there was one Danish study that that identified that the longer herds have been organic, the lower the bulk tank somatic cell counts were. So one thing to, to be a little bit careful about trying to compare information from different quant countries across different production systems as I just mentioned before is that that management is very difficult or uh, different and and also uh, requirements in respect to recording health incidents and so forth might might be different uh, particularly recording of, of treatments and so forth so quite often uh, or at least in in the EU I mean there's a lot of recording required in respect to using antibiotics for mastitis treatment but there aren't any um, requirements in respect to uh, 
non-antibiotic uh, treatments for, for mastitis. So if you're basing studies based on treatments rather than actually occurrences of disease, there might be some differences between them. So uh, this is just from, from a study that was actually led by MSU in in the late 90s and early 2000s, where they looked at bulk tank somatic cell counts uh, on 99 conventional farms and 32 organic farms. So these are just the categories of uh, bulk tank somatic cell counts. And you can see they're relatively similar. They seem to be a little bit higher uh, bulk tank somatic cell counts uh, in organic, but this is just one study. If you take all the studies across most of um, countries and, and so forth. It, some studies will find that it seemed to be a little bit higher on organic farms. Some, find, some will find that it's higher on conventional farms. So it kind of goes both ways. So um, going back to to the antimicrobial resistant for, for just a second. So when it comes to, to conventional farms, I mean, there's been a lot of pressure from, from the government, uh, different uh, consumer and uh, organizations and so forth in respect to reducing the use of antibiotics on, on any type of livestock production. So um, that is one reason why alternatives to, to antibiotics for actually direct treatment of mastitis um, might be a, a venue and, and that's what we thought. There's also a decrease in the market incentives for developing new drugs um, and then of course as you know I mean the organic industry is growing there's more milk produced more cows and so forth and then there are really few tested alternatives products for, for treatment of, of mastitis. I mean, I've only been able to find one uh, of a product that's available in the US. There's some other studies that have been done other places in, in the world. Um, we can probably skip that one. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about mastitis. As I said, I'm not a mastitis expert, but maybe here we can have a little bit of of discussion of uh, what you are doing uh, both to prevent mastitis and and what you might do when you have clinical cases and so forth i'd definitely like to hear that um, mastitis and and the public uh, prevention of mastitis some of the treatment options that are available for organic producers right now and and i'll finish with um, a little bit of information on the research project that that we are that we are doing. We have to about twenty past or something like that. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll keep an eye on it. I guess. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, inflammation of the mammary grant gland uh, mastitis. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an infection caused by bacteria, algae, or protozoa, but that's definitely the most common cause of, of, uh, of mastitis. Uh, most of the economic losses, uh, so whether it's treatment cost or loss of milk and so forth, are due to uh, staphylococci, streptococci, and coliform uh, mastitis. But I think there's probably close to a hundred organisms that have been uh, identified as as having a, a cause in mastitis. So, but these are the most uh, common ones. And then they are typically split up into environmental uh, pathogens and contagious pathogens, and then kind of the opportunistic bacteria, the coagulase negative streptococci. We have to be a little bit careful because everything is not black and white, right? So just because we call them a contagious mastitis pathogen doesn't mean that they can't infect the cow through the environment. I mean, if, if a cow has a staph infection and she's leaking um, 
in one of the stalls or something like that, another cow comes in, lies down, and it can certainly be spread that way as well, so through the environment, but they're considered contagious. And it's the same thing for the environmental bacteria uh, causing mastitis. You can't have a cow that's, um, that had an environmental bacterial uh, other infection, and if you're not clean between milkings and so forth, they can certainly be spread that way as well. But most of that, the env environmental spread uh, is from the environment. Clinical mastitis typically just uh, defined as having some sort of, of visible abnormality, so whether it's to the bag or whether it's to the milk. Uh, cows produce lit uh, less milk, as I mentioned earlier, with mastitis. So typically, there'll be either under heat, it'll be sensitive to the touch, there might be some smell, swelling, and they're de usually defined as, as mild, moderate, or severe in, in their presentation. So the most severe ones are the ones that have a really sudden onset, pretty much just watery milk, and typically the cow is systemically uh, affected as well. I mean, she might, you'll be able to see it on her, her behavior. Uh, detection, do most of you do force stripping when, when you milk? I assume you, you'll be doing that right. So uh, do you d strip into a cup or on a boot or on the floor to check the, for anything in the milk? In the gutter, right? Exactly, and that's that's what most uh, people do. The only thing to be careful about, it's not the only thing, one thing to be careful about when, when you do the force stripping and so forth is not to contaminate your hands and and also the area in which you're working. I mean, so if you can't do it in the gutter or something like that, I mean, you should try to, to get it removed, I mean, flush it away or flush it away so, so you don't have the contamination from, from cow to cow. Subclinical mastitis, no visible changes in the odor of milk, uh, but there is an infectious agent in there. It's just not so severe an infection that, that it actually uh, changes the appearance of the milk. And those can definitely be a source of infections of other cows because it's something that you're not aware of. Um, so we'll get back to that a little bit uh, later in, in respect to some things that you can do. I mean, I'm sure that, that a lot of you, um, if you know that you have cows with, for instance, conta contagious mastitis pathogen, it could be a staph or something like that. Do many of you milk them later in, or last or something like that? Usually, yeah. a milk pail. Okay. So milk in a pail and and uh, disinfect uh, what you use, right? Okay. Uh, how do most of you do? Most of you do regular checks for uh, subclinical mastitis, like using a California mastitis test, or yeah. Any of you on DHI testing? You are so once a month you'll you'll get somatic cell counts on individual cows and so forth. Do they do any culturing for you as well? Or? They will. They will if you uh, request it. If you want to, you know, uh, see exactly what organism you're dealing with, they'll do culture tests. Right. And and also uh, some other independent labs do like uh, Eastern Labs up in Medina, Ohio. Sometimes we'll just ship it up to them. All right. Do any of you have any plans for set in place for, for culturing of, of cows or like you do? We bought a uh, an incubator and a bunch oh, of plates and started trying it. Right. And uh, we, we've also once a year paid the extension in our cities. In New York, the team comes will come through and check out right. and equipment and culture every cow for it. Right. And we're looking to see if we can get quicker. So you do some, or at least did some culturing on on your culture data over data the over the years. Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, one thing is that sometimes with uh, if you have cows that are maybe high somatic cell counts over a couple of test days or something, that might be some to potentially pull out and, and get cultures mm -hmm. so you have an idea about uh, what, what it might be, be causing it. Any of you have your bulk tank milk cultured or just general bacterial counts? Or? Coliform test, I'm not, okay, excellent. So yeah, th those are definitely some of, uh, some of the options available. So typically as inflammation increases, the somatic cell count will be increases, increased as well. And, and um, you know, the California mastitis test is relatively easy and, and a good measure of whether you have some, some issues in a quarter or, or not. Uh, of course, the DHI testing, and some places will just have conductivity or something like that that are being measured every day uh, on the cows just as a measure of how many cells are in the milk and so forth. So that can be an indication as well. I just wanted to say a couple of things about mastitis and you and, and, um, and the public just, just in uh, general, and I definitely don't mean to, to preach here, but all of you know that, that <clears throat> mastitis, decrease in productivity, decrease in the quality of, of the milk and so forth. Seems like pasteurization at least have been taking care of, of most of the issues of transmission of pathogens and zoonotic pathogens, the pathogens that are uh, spread between humans and, and animals. Uh, but there seemed to be an increased market for, for raw milk and and at least raw milk products, it's much more common, I think, in, in Europe than it is here. So in that respect, there certainly are some possibilities for, um, for spread of diseases. I'm not sure if, if most of the bacteria uh, that are causing mastitis is necessarily a huge public health issue. I mean, except when they're there in really, really high numbers. I mean, enough bacteria, no matter which one it is, in high enough numbers, I think it can make us sick, right? So, uh, but that's, that's definitely something to take into consideration. And then there's also the animal welfare issue. I mean, if you just look at, look at ourselves, I mean, we feel crappy when we are, when we are sick. So there's an issue about keeping keeping animals healthy as, as well. And, you know, the more healthy they are, the, the fewer days where they aren't feeling well they have. Uh, milking and prevention of mastitis uh, is really a, a huge topic. Mm -hmm. and, and I gathered a little bit of information here from, from some other uh, sources. Low stress is really key to, to having a good milking. So both in respect to, to milk let down and so forth. I mean, if cows are stressed, some of the hormones that are released might have felt, affect milk uh, let down. Uh, check the milk as we talked about uh, by, by pre-stripping. Um, any of you do routinely washing and pre-dipping of of others and teats before milking? Yeah, right, a lot of you do, okay. Um, it's important to, to give the disinfectant some, some time to work before you, you wipe it off. But all of these things help to milk let down, so a much smoother milking and a faster milking. Um, and then after, you know, everybody has their routines when they're doing these things, but but the machine should be put on within one and a half to two minutes after you finish your, um, your pre-milking pre routine. Um, adjustment of the unit, as somebody mentioned, at least once a year or twice a year, have it tested, make sure that, that everything works as it is and uh, as it should. Um, it's important to detach the unit without vacuum on it and not over milking the cows because that affects teat ends and, and the teat canal and may make them more open for bacteria to be able to come into them. Post dipping, 
probably most of you do as well, I'm, mm. I'm sure. I was just going to say one thing in, in the winter, and you may be doing it already, but uh, so you don't send cows out with, with wet teeth, so you shouldn't be sending out with uh, cows with wet teats. I mean, they can get fr frost damage and so forth. So, at least let the post it work for for thirty seconds or so, and then wipe them off so they are not wet when they when they go out. I think your attach units are way off. You put in two minutes. It should be more like ten to fifteen seconds, maybe thirty seconds. Uh, the 90 seconds would be the standard protocol that the hormone That's, release takes about 90 seconds from when I mean, it's so it's, it's from the start of when you start doing everything. So if you count the time from when you start stripping, uh, well, it's not necessarily from the start, but I mean, you start stripping and you do the pre-dipping and, and so forth. And then after you finish that, yeah, I mean, I've, the most common reference that I see is about 90 seconds or so forth because it does take a little bit of time for, for everything to use. Just a couple of things uh, for, for therapeutic and just choices and, and uh, milk quality in, in, in general. So some of the things that you can do with getting somatic cell counts of individual cows and and culturing and so forth is you know strategically pull out the cows that consistently have uh, high somatic cell counts and have mastitis again and again and and so forth uh, whether cows have it in just one quarter or whether they have it in multiple quarter and then also if if the pathogens that are associated with it are some of those bacteria or other organisms that that typically we can't really treat for uh, this is mainly in respect to to antibiotics but um, they're just some of them they become chronic and they're really difficult to deal with uh, I just put this on here and it's it's associated a little bit with with the advantages of, of culturing if if you can and and have an interest in it because even on on conventional dairies where antibiotics uh, can be used um, there are at least some organisms that it's questionable whether it's actually does any good to to use antibiotics and particularly coliform mastitis is there are a couple of products now that that uh, have shown that they have some effect but one of the neat things about it is also that you know for instance a big dairy that's associated with with the university started culturing all their cows and they made treatment decisions based on these cultures and they were able to reduce their antibiotic use but about by about 50 percent so from a public perception uh, cost and so forth i mean there there certainly is some some value if if you can do it and then the last thing I've, I think I'm going to say about milk quality uh, in particular uh, or specifically is is uh, how you how you deal with it I mean how many of you guys milk all by yourself or do you have people that help milking people that help milking I mean right uh, so teamwork is is really important uh, I took this from uh, dr. Ron Erskine something that he wrote for the National Mastitis Council NMC uh, recently um, he is a mastitis expert but right now they actually have a USDA grant as well looking uh, at mastitis but rather than treatments and how to prevent it because I think the general thought is we have a pretty good handle on that now we need to deal with with the people that are actually uh, doing it and it's actually quite a common thread in a lot of research that are being doing now and Sari has been leading it that that there's a huge sociologic psychological component of how we deal with diseases and so forth so when it comes to 
to treatment and protocols and so forth. I mean, it's human nature to drift away from from things that we are doing. I mean, and most most commonly, we just not we don't do it uh, conscientiously. I mean, it's or consciously we just drift away from from what we are doing. Uh, so it's important they found to have regular scheduled meetings where you just go over the the protocols for in this example mastitis prevention milking uh, treatments and so forth and uh, also important is that people that are working whatever it is that we are doing that we know why we are doing it not just you have to do this it's very important to also inform people why they are doing it uh, and then his analogy is and i thought well I thought of many more analogies i guess but the analogy is basketball coach is not just going to show up on on the first date and tell people how to position for a rebound he does it over and over again uh, through a season and so forth and the same when it comes to uh, when it comes to to education and communication with with people that are doing different tasks on your on your dairies there's a lot of very good information uh, available on setting up health plans and improving working with milk quality and mastitis and so forth and uh, I meant to look up, but I'm sure that OSU actually has some information, and there's definitely a lot of information from Cornell University, the milk quality lab, and uh, from uh, from Wisconsin as well. And I don't mean to leave anybody out on on purpose here. These are red Danish cows, um, a very traditional milk breed in in Denmark, but they are they are also uh, seem like more and more are going to Holstein, Holstein Friesians. I actually, my neighbor had uh, red cows, uh, so they're very nice cows. Anyway, <laughs> red cows. I'm sorry. Red cows. You have red cows. But they're Ayrshire's. Okay, <laughs> I actually my significant other, her grandfather, uh, imported some red cows to uh, to Michigan, but. I think they just kind of been diluted out now. These are uh, eight points out of the ten points about uh, or from NMC in respect to uh, practical other health uh, plans. So what uh, Linda Tipskovsky from Cornell, she's, at least she was at Cornell at the time, just took eight of those ten out because the others were uh, related to treatment of of. Um, with antibiotics and so forth. I'm not going to go into them in, in detail. If we have time at the end, I mean, we can talk a little bit more about it, but um, there is a lot of, of good information in there. Okay, so on to uh, some of the substances uh, I've been able to find a little bit of, of information about, because sometimes prevention just isn't enough and you end up with mastitis, right? So there is very little information available to what organic producers use in, in the U.S. There's a little bit more information uh, from the EU. Disclaimer up front here, just because I put something on here doesn't mean that you should do it. It's a survey of what people uh, reported that, that they were, were doing and particularly putting anything into the quarter uh, have to be very, very careful about because most instances it's it's illegal because it's consideration considered an adulteration of of, uh, of the milk which is illegal but in the EU it seemed like homeopathy uh, and particularly other other liniments like peppermint and mint ointments rubbed on the others were used a lot also frequent milking okay. very little story I I never read James Harriet actually until I was done with with vet school, uh, but there was one one story that he was telling. There was a 
a guy he came out to a cow had mastitis and he had told him you know strip it out frequently or keep milking it and he came back the next morning and the guy was sitting sleeping with his head up against the cow because he'd been out there and he's just been milking milking the cow pretty much all night and the mastitis was gone so <laughs> it probably helps <laughs> I'm an epidemiologist. I work with animals in populations. That's kind of my specialty. That's an N of one or a sample size of one, so don't put too much. But, but definitely frequent milking uh, does work. Some used uh, aloe infusions in the others. Don't do that. Uh, from the US, uh, there's been a, a few studies that looked at what at least were being used on organic farms and there were some things that were used intramammary. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but other treatments, systemic use of whey products, so injection, uh, garlic tincture, uh, aspirin, vet, vet, vegetable oils, electrolytes and vitamin Bs and so forth. And I'm going to get back to Hubert Carman Later, he's a veterinarian in Pennsylvania that is really the expert on, on treatment of uh, organic dairy cows. Uh, he has, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of good information in, in, in respect to just herd health uh, and diseases on, on dairy farms. 50 minutes, okay. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, that's okay, it's not your fault. Anyway, um, I'll just move on to the thing. Oh, actually, let me just go back once. What are the most common things that, that you use for, for cows with mastitis, if, if you don't mind sharing as treatment? <laughs> Put some peppermint oil on the on the bag sometimes. Right. Uh, I haven't put anything peppermint in, oil. Yeah, I've never put anything in it. In the corn, right? Which is organic. Right. Uh, for, uh, my opinion on the stripping, I'm going to just say so. Right. We don't strip. It's opinion much on more stripping. more important in our milk we milk with 15 to 20 units and. The milkers are busy and it's much more, occasionally one won't milk out. And my opinion is it's much more better to make sure you don't miss anything at the end rather than the beginning. If you're squirting, your gloves get dirty. If there's, we do have staff in our herd. Right. And we've gotten rid of that mostly just by calling. Right. Uh, and uh, we just it's just awful rare. We milk a hundred cows mostly. It's rare to see a clinical case. It's all subclinical what we generally deal with. Right. So an opinion on on stripping, uh, not doing it because it just, it's a way of reducing potential contamination of yourself at least. Does, we don't feel it's needed. On don't our feel farm. it's needed. It's just, okay. We're not taking. We're not going to treat an animal if we identify her with a, a bad milk. Right. If, if maybe a couple times a year we find a hard, hard hot quarter, you're going to find it by touching the and putting hands on the other rather than right. than looking at. You'll see it. Right. Uh, and do you have any any issues in bolt tanks or medic cell counts or no, like that? No, we try to strive for the. We we don't always hit the best bonus, but we right. usually. Uh, it's rare to go above 150,000, okay. and they check every lo every load. So yours is about 150,000. Yeah, last don't check. We had all of them. Right. Every test was under 100,000. Right. Okay. So you don't get the formula anymore. You don't right. pre-strip. We don't strip. I can't say well, that's what you should do, but I actually quit stripping beforehand too. Last couple weeks, I've been so cold. If you're gonna treat a sick. <laughs> Cow and you, I do half the milking and the, I supervise fairly carefully. The other, the one person does the other half, so we don't have a whole crowd of people coming and going. And we're not going to give in, but we're not going to treat a bad. You're not going to treat. We're just going to make sure it gets taken care of good. Right. So there's, I, I, I don't know. It's we've got plenty to do, and it seems like that stripping will take 
uh, half the time of getting a cow ready to milk. So for you, it's mainly a time issue. Yeah, not mainly, but it Maybe. just doesn't it seems like a waste of time. I'll say it bluntly. Okay, it seems like a waste of time. <laughs> I know everybody says to do it, but. Well, and I think that it also depends on, on what you'll be able to or willing to do if you find some. Right. I mean, uh, you know, the main thing from my perspective would, would probably be, I mean, that uh, what might go into the, the milk supply that you, that you don't see, right? So uh, chunky milk and, and so forth. It doesn't seem like you have a, well, an issue with it, very often. right? Right. I've used uh, the different whey products, which are used whey products injectable, right? Uh, since the early 1980s, and I think they definitely work and have a place. Uh, the whey products recently right. we've used the garlic tincture using a six cc syringe, and we put three cc's of garlic tincture or oil in there with three cc's of aloe vera juice working on an echo that's in the vulva. Yeah. Right. It works better if you have a cannula or something so you can actually get it in there. Otherwise, you kind of have to pinch the vulva closed until most of it's absorbed or whatever. But you can, you can smell the garlic on the cow's breath in about three or four minutes. So wow. I know it's very systemic. And, right. And, you know, right. It, it's, it's affecting the cow. Right. I, I haven't done anything with vegetable oil. I, I know a lot. I think it says IMM. Oh, intermammary, right, right, yeah. And um, <laughs> I've gotten away from putting anything in the quarter. Right. I think anytime you do that, more than likely you're pushing something else up in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and using vitamins, the vitamin E is very effective. Right. Uh, back in the 1980s, there was a lot of research done with vitamin E and selenium and uh, doing vitamin E and selenium three times a year. Uh, every trimester has been shown to reduce incidence of mastitis 75%. So that's, that's easily worth doing and not right. very expensive and that will also help uh, cows with, you know, heat and all that. Right cycling properly right. but we do strip and I've known some dairy farmers that just put the milk around the cow to make sure that the cow doesn't actually have any dairy on it but uh, they just put the milker on the cow and, and uh, we found with our cows if you don't strip you're sacrificing good milk let down and, and it right. just ends up taking longer for the cow right. to milk if you don't have let down right so, comment about stripping and, and milk let down and so forth. I mean, I think one thing that's important there too is that if you don't have let good milk let down, it takes longer, and then there's also more probability of of damaging teat ends and so forth because it sits on there and sucks for a longer time. And if there's nothing coming out, I mean, you're losing. Uh, so, so that's something to take uh, into consideration. You talked about uh, like a 50-50 mix of garlic tincture and aloe vera mm -hmm. juice uh, in the vulva. You can also do it in the mouth. Oh, in the mouth. Okay. Right. Just to right. Do it that way. And you also mentioned you never put anything in the quarter of the cows, and and I think that. I think it's a very, very good strategy to have, uh, just because there really isn't anything that's approved for for use in the other. So you have to be very careful about. Well, one thing we noticed back when we used antibiotics, like right. through the eighties, I followed the book. Right. And, uh, we did dry cow treatments and everybody, and and uh, we always had mastitis. It never seemed to get any better. It never antibiotics never seemed to actually cure it. The, the mastitis would always come back. All right. Ninety percent of the time, it would come back. We've been more successful using uh, homeopathic remedies and the treatments that you see up there than, right. than we ever were with antibiotics. Right. 
So you you have better success in preventing mastitis now than you had when when you had antibiotics available Definitely. to you. And then with antibiotics, you'd use one product for one or two years, and then they'd say well, that one doesn't work anymore. Right. So now we're using this right. one. You use that right. one a year or two. Right. They were always changing <coughs> because the bacteria just become resistant so quickly. Um. I was going to make one. Oh yeah, so uh, you'll see that in just a second. I'll I'll talk about one product that that uh, Chiroman has actually developed for for intramammary use. And one of the things that they did was that they they looked at how long could they detect one of the active ingredients in this phyto uh, pseudocol in the cows. And, and so one thing that I just want to say. I mean, anything that it's not. Anything you use, I mean, it's not just what goes into the quarter, but anything that you inject and put in the in the vulva as well. You mentioned that that you can smell the garlic breath on them very shortly after you use it. So it's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, you know, withdrawal times. I mean, how long should I keep it back so you don't have any of those things getting into to potentially meat and and milk and and one thing that, that scared me a little bit about vegetable oils, uh, if they are being being used to put into quarters, would be an, an example would be peanut oil, for instance. You know, you would want to make sure that some of that doesn't get into to the milk supply. I mean, just because of people that have you know allergies to to peanut oil. It's maybe not a good example, but it's an example of some things that. That that uh, could potentially happen and actually adulterate the milk. I know. I know. There's a lot of resistance <clears throat> among our uh, milk inspectors with all of these treatments. Right. Simply because they haven't been approved by the FDA. A lot right. Of them. Right. And so when they we we hide them, we don't leave them, you know, in the back room in the in the milk house. Right. But they work more effectively than the antibiotics, which have done FDA approved, right. ever did. So, so at least the combination of what you use now with <clears throat> changes in management, nutrition, and, and other things, uh, you, you think work much better for you now than, than when you did it more traditionally, if you will. We have a more consistent uh, somatic cell count now. OK. And we strive to keep it under 200,000, which right. is usually around the 150. Right. Okay, well, uh, I'll, the only thing I'm going to say from this slide here, so obviously, just uh, because you don't have any data on efficacy doesn't mean that, that it doesn't work, but, but uh, I, think, I think there is room for, for studies uh, to do it. There's just very little money available to to looking into some of <laughs> it wasn't a stab at you, Beth. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but but the main thing to me is be safe, right? I mean, both uh, when it comes to to cow health, but also to the public that that you're submitting your your product or you're selling your products to, and. Uh, Okay, so on to the, the phytomass. So Dr. Hubert Kahneman has his, his own little, uh, I shouldn't say little because I don't know if it is, but it's called Bovinity Health. Uh, and he has a product uh, that, can, that has been tested for its efficacy against uh, mastitis, and it's, it's an intramammary product. Uh, it's a plant-based uh, mastitis treatment. Uh, and it's actually approved for uh, by the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. So one thing that I just mentioned uh, before was that that uh, when you put something into to an animal, I mean, you may be able to to detect it for a while afterwards. So whether it's bad for for people that either drink the milk or or eat the meat, but just as an example here, he has gone at least to some length uh, to de uh, determine whether 
uh, some of the active ingredients in, in this phytoceutical hangs around for uh, a while afterwards. Uh, they have, they have, sorry, there was an announcement on the loudspeakers here. Um, they have, they have tested it and basically what they did was they used it for three days and then they evaluated for clinical cure after four days. And the ones that weren't cured at the time, I mean, they followed until they were cured. They also looked at somatic cell counts. Uh, right, so time is one of the, I didn't put them on here. You can find them in the book. You can just do a, a search. I mean, it'll tell you there are three main products uh, in, in that uh, mastitis tube. I should have put them on there, I apologize. Um, there seemed to be a faster resolution uh, of clinical or with clinical cure in the cows that were treated. Where I got that information, there wasn't actually any information on what they used as a control, and I have a feeling that it was just a negative control to which they, they didn't do uh, anything. There wasn't any difference in somatic cell counts, but uh, they also did some work in respect to uh, using it as a dry cow treatment. So. The data that's available on this product right now are not the end all, be all, and and it's not just glorious, but but it's an it's a good example that that there are people that are are working on alternative uh, treatments for uh, intermemory or intermemory treatments of of uh, mastitis. So let me just say two words. Is that okay? about what we are doing here. Uh, so we got this grant funded by, by SERI to actually look at non-antibiotic uh, alternatives to a mastitis treatment. And the main thing that uh, we looked at so far is Manuka honey. How many of you have heard of Manuka honey? Right. So it's from New Zealand, uh, produced by honeybees there. Honey has been known for a long time to have antibacterial properties. Most of it is contributed to a peroxide effect. But this honey, even when you take that peroxide effect away, it actually has antibacterial properties. So that was one that we wanted to look at. The next one we'll look at is probably going to be oregano oil because what we proposed initially we just can't get in good enough quality. So I'm concerned that we might have okay. the next three. We can start. All oh, right, right. Cut this off. I know you're all interested. Oh no, that's are you gonna fine. be around no, are you gonna be around for a Yeah, yeah. So if I more questions about the research and then I'll let you go if you have to get to other sessions. And just as a reminder, always check with your certifier before you use any products. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very good point. From the person reading your files and writing you letters, please check with us before you use anything. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.